For those of you who are joining us tonight for the very first time, mm -hmm. uh, my name is John Fields and I'm the Senior Director for the Abrams Engel Institute for the Visual Arts, or AVA for short. We are a visual arts center located on the campus of the University of Alabama at Birmingham, and we present eight to 10 exhibitions a year, highlighting a mix of regionally, nationally, and internationally acclaimed contemporary artists. We serve a diverse audience that includes university faculty, staff, and students, artists, museum patrons, and donors, local institutions, and the national and international visual arts community, while also striving to ensure our exhibitions remain directly relevant and engaging to our surrounding Birmingham communities. Since our opening in 2014, AVA has been featured in national media outlets such as the New York Times, the Huffington Post, The Nation, Raw Vision Magazine, and PBS Canvas, to name a few. We are very proud that all of our exhibitions and related educational programming are free and open to the public. And so if you have a good time tonight, we would definitely love for you to join us again. I really want to thank Evan from Bordolami Gallery in New York for working with us to make this event happen. And of course, Rebecca, Rebecca Morris for taking time out of her schedule to spend her evening here with us. And so now I will turn it over to Tina Ruggieri, who is Ava's assistant curator and the host for this event. Well, hello, everyone. Um, again, I want to thank everybody as well for joining us tonight for Ava's Inside the Arts program, where we're featuring Rebecca Morris. Um, as he mentioned, my name is Tina Ruggieri, and I'm the assistant curator at Ava. I want to first also start by thanking um, Stefania Bordolami and Evan uh, Reiser from Bordolami Gallery for helping us make this event possible. And of course, a very huge thank you to Rebecca for giving us some of her time tonight. As a reminder to you all, we love questions, so please feel free to either type your question in the chat feature at the bottom of your screen, or you can save your question until Rebecca is done with her talk. Um, Christina McClellan, um, Ava's education manager, is going to help me field questions tonight, so you can also send your questions directly to her. Um, first, I want to start with a short introduction of Bordolami Gallery, and then I will introduce Rebecca. Uh, Bordolami Gallery <coughs> opened in 2005, and since 2017 has been located in the Tribeca neighborhood of Lower Manhattan. The gallery has exhibited multiple shows by Richard Aldridge, um, Barbara Caston, Ivan Morley, Morgan Fisher, and Tom Burr artists with whom the gallery has had uh, long-standing relationships with. Uh, the Bordolami program has expanded to include such artists as Daniel Buren um, and Veronica uh, Janssens, um, Caitlin Keogh, of course, Rebecca Morris, uh, Leslie Vance, and Marina Reingans um, and Virginia Overton. Um, they've also expanded regionally uh, with the launch of the Artist City Initiative, which brings evolving year-long exhibitions to cities across the United States. Um, Rebecca's paintings often include organic shapes se separated by uh, jagged borders, a constellation of pigments, which we call maps or aerial landscapes. Oils are thin to the point of watercolor and judiciously applied from above. Rebecca positions her large canvases face up on the floor so that the thin paint does not drip right off of the surface. As most of her paintings are significantly larger than her own body, she glides just above them on custom-built scaffolding, a large uh, literal bridge on wheels which allows her her a greater opportunity to direct the unruly fluid color. Her distinct and constantly evolving motifs include step patterns, checkerboards, stylized grids, and overlapping hook shapes the artist refers to as lobster claws, a nod to her upbringing in Connecticut and appreciation for maritime iconography. Rebecca was born in 1969, and she currently lives and works in Los Angeles, California. She has been the subject of significant solo exhibitions at the Blafford Art Museum in Houston, um, the Bonnet Fontaine Museum in Holland. She has also had presentations at, made in LA at the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles, the 2014 Whitney Biennial at the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York, and the Renaissance Society in Chicago. 
Her next museum exhibition will be a solo show at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. And now let me welcome Rebecca Morris. Thank you very much. This is a um, really nice introduction and thank you so much for inviting me. This is uh, my favorite part of um, how to use Zoom, <laughs> which is that you can do these uh, geographically, um, uh, you know, impossible lectures that wouldn't be able to happen otherwise. And I teach, so I'm also using Zoom all the time teaching and I've brought in a lot of people to my classes this way too. So it's great. and. Um, it's a very generous uh, process, so I'm into it. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so there's my name. <laughs> so we can go to the next image. <laughs> um, this is we're gonna. The first group of images we're gonna look at are gonna be from my solo show in New York that is actually up right now, but closed. Um, it opened in February, um, sort of right before everything really got crazy so um anyway so this is like when you walk into the gallery there's a long hallway and these columns that are on the right and there's a uh, a smaller room to the left and so this is the approach so next slide please um and so the point of kind of showing you these images first is to just have you be able to see the scale of the work um the work is uh each scale of each painting is very particular to that painting. Um, I don't think in this show there are any two sizes that are the same. The proportions of the shapes are differing. There are square shapes. There are off square shapes. There, I'm really interested in kind of tall, skinny verticals right now. Um, I'm also interested in contrast within the paintings formally, and then a contrast externally between the paintings as they exist in a, a space together. Next slide. Um, I'm also uh, really committed to working at a large scale. Um, it's very exciting, and I can talk more about that as we go. Next slide. This is one of the paintings that I kind of nicknamed the lobster claw paintings, and they have a recurring hook shape uh, that is changed. I, I, this might be like the eighth one at this point. Um, so next slide. So here you can kind of see the gallery space. I was really excited to um, have my show here. Uh, and I worked on this work. It took me a year to prepare for the show. I'm a slow painter or, I mean, I shouldn't say that I'm slow, like that that's a derogatory term, but um the paintings take time to make and I make them kind of piece by piece, um, part by part. Um, and this space is so beautiful. It was, a, it was really exciting to me to have a chance to show the really large paintings that I've been making for the last, you know, seven or so years and to do that in New York, which is, you know, the classical American painting city. <laughs> Not that there aren't other cities, but just with the history of um, mid-century painting, New York is, um, you know, it has that historical uh, precedent and it's, um, it's a great context. So these are two paintings that um, normally it was interesting when we were hanging the show, I wouldn't have probably liked to see them together because they have some more iterative tendencies, meaning that they are a kind of field painting with um, these uh, metallic lines on top and both in both paintings the lines are gold. Next slide. This is the um, painting that we hung in the office. There, um, I'm really, I've been investigating the color pink for I mean a really long time and I think I've kind of doubled down on thinking about pink more recently and, and this is the latest version of thinking about that color. I'm interested in it because I think that it gets, uh, it doesn't really get the kind of um, critical investigation as a color as I, I think it should. Um, it's also a very gendered color. Um, and I think it's way more complicated than that kind of a read. I like the way it deals with the body. 
um, the beautiful parts of the body and the kind of gross and unseemly parts of the body, the really internal parts. Um, I also just think it's an incredibly beautiful color. It has a huge range. Um, and I like that it has, uh, some vulgarity and contra and, uh, attitude. Um, next slide. So in looking at this painting, um, this is what, let me see how to say this. Um, so this painting is made by each individual piece of the painting. Each section is built independently. So I think in this one, I started with the lower left-hand corner, that big, wide, squiggly line. And so I did that, and then I painted the area, quote, inside of it, and then built the next shape either off of that or off of another edge of the painting. And so this is not worked on all at once it's worked on piece by piece and it's worked on with an exterior line uh and then an interior uh painting is is made inside of it um so that's why they take so long and each time i'm doing this there's a new decision to be made and each decision hinges on the previous one so sometimes these are very determined i know exactly what i'm going to do and sometimes i don't and i need to think sometimes i make a mistake and don't like it and have to erase it which i don't have a lot of time to do um because it's oil paint and it sort of dries uh actually in the way i paint with oils it dries pretty quickly at least in the staining um so I kind of have to make decisions and then if I don't like it, I have to live with it. So here's that pink painting again. I'm also really interested in creating uh, borders and um, areas inside of a painting, a kind of framic. These are kind of going a little fast. Am I going too slowly? Okay. <laughs> um, so the, the border area or the margin sets up a, a kind of device in the painting where there are hierarchical areas of space. So in this painting, there's a wide border in this kind of, uh, I don't know what kind of color that is. It's like a dirty ballet shoe pink. Um, and, and then that has this internal area that's quite busy. So, so the frame sets up this idea of which part of the painting is the part of the, which part of the painting is the painting, which part is the important part of the painting, um, and which is the exterior, which is the interior, how are we to look and determine what we're looking at. Okay, next image. The paintings are really, really thin. Um, I use a lot of solvent. I paint them flat on the floor. That way I can control the paint. I mean, I'm not really controlling it too much, but um, it, with this consistency of paint, if they were vertical, the, the paint would just fall off the surface. So it's like the consistency of watercolor. Next image. This is just another detail. I was thinking a lot about how to make a painting in pink, but you can't, I'm not interested in making the whole painting in pink because then it's just too much pink. Pink needs something to work against. So in this case, it's a green and these kinds of reds and some purples. Next image. This is a different kind of type of painting. Um, I did the red ground first, and then that left these negative spaced areas that then I went back into and worked on individually until the whole painting was finished. Um, and this kind of comes off the heels of about six years of trying to make the ultimate red painting. Next image. Next image. So hopefully these details help you understand the, the um, thinness and uh, transparency and uh, uh, the, the details show that there are the edges aren't really clean, that things, the, the edges and the way things meet and touch are soft. Next image. This is another painting from the exhibition. Um, in the last 
you know, the, the, the checkerboard paintings definitely come out of my interest in the grid, but thinking about the grid in a different way. Instead of thinking about the grid, which we do when we think about the lines of a grid, I started thinking about the, um, I guess if you're thinking in terms of a grid, the negative space would be the checkerboard. So I started thinking about the checkerboard and I was resistant to it for a long time because I didn't like the way it was so literally um, a floor or a decorative motif in a way that was really straightforward. But um, the idea kept burning at me. And so, you know, I just did it anyway, which is sort of what happens. Um, and this has a gold overlay on top. So it's a thicker paint painted on top. And then um, it's all masked out to protect the checkerboard part. And it's spray painted gold. Next image. Next image. We take a lot of details like this so you can understand the edges and the masking. And um, So a, a newer idea in my work is going back to the grid, but breaking the grid and creating almost like a rip or a snag in it. Um, and I think this, this, came from the other paintings I'm making that have these jagged and uh, disrupted edges. And I wanted to carry that kind of language into these grid paintings. So thinking about that, um, that torn it edge kind of comes from some of the other work. Next image. This painting was made by having a piece of canvas on the floor of my studio that was gessoed but not stretched and it collected the marks of other paintings while I made them. So this very uh, vertical kind of red line on the right here was made from another painting being painted on top and that was the red oil paint that dripped down the side and collected. And that's why it's such a straight line because it's going down the, the you know straight edge inside of the painting. Um, other areas here I did paint on. You can see some shoe marks because I'm walking all over it. And then I also use these tarps to clean my brushes or to remove paint from a brush before I paint because there's, you know, I don't want as much paint on a brush. So they just collect these marks. And at a certain point, I think they become interesting. And then I stretch them and they become paintings. And what's helpful about these for me is that I kind of am relieved from always thinking about a composition. Next image. This is another, what I call tarp painting stretched. Next image. It's a whole field of silver. It's difficult to photograph. Um, next image. This is one of these tall verticals I'm really interested in. It's another kind of broken grid painting, but now it's very minimal. I'm working on a, a kind of sister to this painting right now, actually. I'm, I'm this field of gray. I made a very large amount of it. So I have another painting coming with the same field of gray, just a different section of the canvas. So you can kind of see that spray painted line. It's like a, a TIG line from welding. Next image. Here, this is just looking at my same visual language again, but kind of trying to dissect it in a new way. Next image. Pink and gold are um, intoxicating together. It's kind of, they're, they're, it's a kind of vulgarity um, that I like. It, disruptions of taste, those are things that are interest me as well and that I think about in the work. Next image. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about the lobster claws. Um, I don't know how much time I have. Does anybody know? You're still doing really good on time. Okay, good. Yeah, you still, um, yeah, keep, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I lost my stopwatch. Um, um, so this is, I have to say too that the photography, of, the photography of my work where you just look at a static image like this, I really don't like. 
because you can't really tell a lot about the scale of the painting. Like when I look at this image, you could be looking at a painting that's like eight and a half by 11 somehow. Like that's, it just doesn't, the scale doesn't communicate. So the images I like best are the ones that are either details or installation shots. Just, it's something I've been thinking about a lot. And especially as I've been talking to my students about how to document their work, you know, for these remote meetings that we're all doing which, you know, becomes really important. So I just don't like that this image just doesn't communicate really well to me, but it's here. And there I am making the painting on top. This is a uh, piece of scaffolding that was customized with four uh, casters that each lock. So it's very stable. It's 15 feet long. So uh, when I work flat, you know, and I'm working at a huge scale, I can't reach the center of the painting. So this bridge can slide over the painting and then I can, you know, shimmy across it and paint. And this is really important because when I make a mark, I want to be able to make a mark on the painting like any other place in the painting I could make a mark. So I need to be like right above, you know, if I have to throw the paint in the middle all the time, all the paint looks thrown. This is a, a short video that you can, we can look at to see how this bridge works. This is me in my studio and my, my nephew was visiting from DC. And I did a full demonstration on how I make a painting and I like got into my painting clothes. I put my mask on. I really wanted, you know, him at age 12 to completely get my world. Um, he had never visited me in California before. Um, so, and then I didn't know my mom took this video. So there's the lobster that now, of course, this is an installation picture I like. Detail. Next image. So this is it in my studio. And another kind of image I'm really interested in are all the pictures I take in my studio because, um, because this is where I make them. This is where I look at them for a really long time. And this painting probably took about 14 months to make um, just because of all the different parts to it and the fact that it's really large and I need help lifting it, etc. cetera. So, um, but I like the photography in the studio. I've always had a studio that had a bright, a, a white brick wall. So there is something really important to me about this irregular surface that the paintings are seen against all the time. And um, the light in my studio is very specific. I, I have electricity, but I don't use it. I have skylights, so I never turn on my lights. You can see in this picture, there's a really terrible light bulb. Um, that's the light bulb. So in California, I don't really need electricity. I, I do have a refrigerator and a coffee machine in there, and <laughs> that's what I use the electricity for. That's the lobster claw painting in progress. And you can see, um, actually, that's the tarp from the painting with the silver grid on top on the floor. And, oh, look, I'm seeing this. There's the pink painting with the metallic lines before the lines are on. They're all on the floor. So, um, And the bridge that's just collecting stuff on it. So that's a typical studio shot. Next image. The lobster claw paintings started in probably the early 2000s. There was one that was a kind of pre-lobster claw that I'll show you. And then after that, I have made them by doing these little drawings first in, an, in a small sketchbook. And then I do a lot of these and then I Xerox them, get them bigger and use an overhead projector to project them on the wall. I decide what size they should be. I measure that size. I order the stretcher bar. The stretcher bar comes. And then I reproject the image, draw it with um, light gray paint and a round brush. So it's very much like using a lead pencil. And I draw and transfer the uh, lobster claw drawing back onto the canvas and then at that point I usually have to edit and make changes because the original drawing was so tiny that the proportions get a little out of wonk at the you know like 10 foot scale because these are like less than two inches next image so this is the first painting that I think of as pre-lobster claw and I think the reason I think about it that way is it's very frontal 
there are these circular shapes um, and that's where the lobster claw comes from. It comes from uh, breaking down this circular shape into a kind of shard. And this composition also has a, a dynamic energy to it. And it's very much about thinking um, about the edges and the corners of the painting compositionally. And that's something that really preoccupies the lobster claw paintings. And that's the first true lobster claw painting. Yeah, it's 2006. This is, uh, this is when I realized, I think the lobster claw idea is still really potent for me. So I went back to the previous image and did a whole bunch of versions of drawings from it. And, and then that's what this, that's how this came out. This one has this border edge to it. And this image, I think, even though it has a lot of uh, movement in its shapes, it still has a kind of stillness and frozen feeling. I think the border does that. And I think there's just something about the uh, separateness of the parts inside. Next image. It's a detail. Each part of the painting inside is painted a very different way, different marks, different brushes. I'm really interested in creating as much kind of uh, contrast as possible. People ask me about my interest if I'm interested in textiles, and I am interested in textiles. Um, and one of the things I like about textiles are those kind of samplers that get made where you're, the artist is trying every stitch they can that's really different. And so I think that's kind of where the textile interest comes from in, in trying to negotiate all these different ways of mark making and creating a whole. Next image. This are that painting and a second one in the Whitney Biennial. This was the last Whitney Biennial in the, um, the Breuer building. So I was really excited that I got to have my paintings in this building. I grew up going to this building um, and I love brutalist architecture and it has this incredible gridded ceiling and this parquet floor. So this, this exhibition space is, you know, just like heaven on earth to me. Next image. This is another lobster claw from 2015. All the lobster claws are vertical and they're all really big in scale. That's really important. They have to be big and, uh, and it's not just because it has to, it's not that it has to have this kind of hero status or, uh, it's like I'm interested in a kind of grandeur. I'm interested in what it feels like to make a painting this size because it's really exciting. You lose track of your body. You can't see it in one view. Um, I become like a speck in terms of working within it. And I really like that disconnect. I also like the feeling of it being so much larger than me. And I don't find that upsetting. I find it actually comforting. Um, kind of enveloping and um, containing. And that's one thing I do like about brutalist architecture too, is that to me, it, it just feels really, uh, you know, womb-like almost, or something like that larger feeling of safety. Next image. This is another lobster claw, also from 2015. Next image. Oh yeah, this is just like more of this this great photography stuff. So you have like the install in the studio, then you have it cropped. Next image. So here are two other lobster claw paintings in my studio in progress. And I think you can, if you get really close to your screen, you can see these gray lines that I talked about that are the drawn lines that make up the image. Um, and so you can see I'm going part by part. Next image, a little further along. It's a detail with the finished painting. Oh no, it's the whole painting. Next image. And I think this is the last one in the talk and uh, this is a lobster claw from 2018. This one has a different kind of space in it. It feels uh, like they're all these sort of bubbles. Of 
know that I was going to spend the next two weeks. Oops. So uh, did you want it? There's this, um, I think we wanted to show this quick um, uh, conversation between me and my friend, painter Mary Weatherford. She'll kind of be our very first question and intro into the question section. <laughs> um. Rebecca, when I first saw your paintings, they were brown and black. This show is a combination. There are some paintings that are high key color and other ones that are neutral. How has your choice of color changed over the years? How do you decide? And what do you think has changed in you to change the color of the paintings? Barry Weatherford, South Africa. Hi, Mary. Thank you for the questions. Rebecca Morris, Los Angeles. What changed in the work was that the scale increased. I started making the paintings very differently. They were much, much larger. Um, I was, have always been painting them on the floor, but when you put a huge canvas on the floor and you see all that white glaring up, I think I just started thinking about the white and I started thinking about the luminosity of that surface and how to build color on white with the idea that light is coming from within, um, which was very different than the dark paintings, which were very heavy and opaque. I was covering those up and layering and building the paint on top. And the paintings I've been making for a while now um, are made through an incredibly light liquid application of paint, which is always trying to do the sort of least for the most. The part of the question about what changed in me is the cool part of the question. <laughs> and that is not putting so much stock in how I needed to move what I wanted to do in my work around something external to myself. So the kind of confidence and assured quality you have when you're on your own path and you just do what you do because you can only do that. Wonderful. Um, so, Christina, do we have any questions that you want to begin with? Do. So, um, from Lisa Moni, would, uh, would be interested in knowing what artists have been her influences? Who's influenced you? Um, I mean, a lot of people. Um, I was reminded recently of this artist who, uh, Moira Dreyer, who has a show in the DC area right now. I think it's also been disrupted by the pandemic. And when I was in graduate school, she had just passed away from breast cancer. And this was 1992. And uh, I had a lot of teachers in graduate school. I worked with Chicago Imagists and they were really interested in artist artists and collections and they loved her work and um or I shouldn't say they like all the Chicago images like the, the teachers that I was working with you know um um the atmosphere of school that I was in um and so learning about her work was really great really thin paint on wood abstraction it helped me understand maybe how to make an abstract painting that it wasn't as necessarily as complicated as I thought it was coming from a realist training. Um, someone like Robert Ryman for the same reason, also Mary Heileman, but I also love suprematist painting. Um, and, uh, a lot of historical painting, there's this, I mean, 
I could go on and on. I mean, Fred Sandback is someone who I love for his deconstruction of the planes of space in a room. That was really influential to me. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. It's a really great question, Lisa. Um, I'm going to just go down the list here. So uh, from Aaron, do you keep any kind of source material around in the studio? If so, where does it come from? Um, not so much. I mean, I have a lot of books in the studio and um, I've recently realized that I shouldn't keep them at my studio because I tend not to look at them as much as I think I would. Um, source material, no, I, I, it's kind of just like up here. Um, I take a lot of pictures all the time and this was something I've always done. I don't even know if that's source material. It's like visual notes. So, um, I think the answer is kind of no, <laughs> which doesn't feel like, doesn't seem like a very cool answer, <laughs> but it might be true. Great. Um, so, uh, also from Aaron, for the lobster claw paintings, do you begin the paintings feeling more free in your color slash pattern choices and then feel increasingly limited as you go, as you, you are challenged to respond to a more complex image? For example, do you begin the painting more quickly and then have the process slow down as you continue? That's a really good question. And that's exactly what happens. That's why I like doing them. And that's why they're really hard and they take a long time because at the beginning you can kind of do any kind of thing and it works because it doesn't have to work in tandem or in cooperation with any other part of the painting. But as I keep doing these parts, they have to make nice enough to make and I don't even know how to describe make nice, but it has to work for me, like in my intuitive sense of how the painting feels and looks. So um, these options get slimmer and slimmer. And so by the end of the painting, I feel like it's really crazy. And I feel like I could screw up the whole painting. Um, and I'm like pulling a rabbit out of the hat to try to finish it. Um, unfortunately, I also do this bad thing of I almost, it seems like I always leave the last place in the painting somehow seems like it's usually in the middle, which is awful because you don't want to put something really out of whack or too um, authoritative or all consuming in the middle because it's such a focal point. But unfortunately I seem to continue to do this. I think I'm always moving in from the edge, but yes, great question. And that's exactly what happens. It's like a puzzle, but I like that. That's, that's the problem solving part of painting that I love. Um, so I have a question. Um, in one of your uh, past lectures, you talked about it being equally important to look at your paintings that are not successful as it is to look at those that are. How do you determine when a painting is successful versus one that you feel is not? I love it when I hear these things I've said. I have no memory of saying <laughs> <laughs> I believe I believe I must have said it. Um, <laughs> um, uh, you know, it's a funny thing that I said this because I think if a painting is really unsuccessful, I destroy it. So I don't know where all these unsuccessful paintings are, but um, <laughs> I think I remember when you were, you were talking about you were struggling with it, but then you came up with an idea, but it was oh. somewhat simple to fix it. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's usually, usually it's time that fixes that. Like I need mm -hmm. a break, but I mean a break from the painting, but yeah. Um, how do I determine? It's really a kind of gut level thing. I mean, sometimes there are color problems. Sometimes I don't like the way the marks combine. I don't like the attitude or something about the painting or the composition can just be like off putting to me. And I, I, I just don't like it. Um, uh, it it's, it's a pretty gut experience. I mean, yeah, sorry. It's it's a, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, it looks like Scott, I'll unmute Scott. It looks like he's raising his hand. Okay, go ahead. Hey, Rebecca. Hi. 
So um, on our last visit to New York, Evan um, showed us some really amazing works on paper. Oh, and I, cool. and I, yeah, I wanted to kind of ask you about, you know, some artists use these sort of works on paper as sketches to their paintings. Some artists that we actually have just become familiar with recently, they actually do the sketches of the paintings when they're done. Where do yours sort of fall in the process? I know you mentioned a little bit about the lobster painting sketches, but in yeah. terms of the works on paper, are they sketches to paintings? Where do they fall in terms of your process? There's sort of a separate thing than the paintings, but definitely interconnected. Um, I like to do them most when there aren't a lot of paintings in my studio um, so that I'm not sort of like, uh, I like them to have to, come into the world on their own without things around sort of informing them or unconsciously informing me. So if um, work has just left the studio for a show or something, that's a great time when I like to do the watercolors. And it's also, you know, sometimes when work leaves from the studio, it can feel a little like you can feel a little kind of like, ugh, you know, a little sense of loss. So to, to go back into another creative endeavor which is a kind of contrast to the paintings is great. Um, and they're really different than the paintings. Like I'm, I'm not trying to do the same things I do in the paintings as I do in the watercolors. Like they're not about scale. They're not about complicated compositions. Um, they're really much more minimal. What? Much more minimal. Yeah, they're minimal. Some can be busy, but the, the components that make them like maybe two colors, three marks, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, and it's really straightforward and I make a lot at once. It's very quick, which is also another kind of, uh, something that works, plays off the paintings, but they're really important because they're so quick and they're so fast. It's like, um, a, a kind of like cross training doing them. And it, it gives me ideas for the paintings later, but I've noticed I never remember the ideas, but <laughs> unconsciously I do like, I've looked through boxes of watercolors in the past and suddenly seen things I've done in the paintings five years later, but had no memory of ever doing it in the, you know, so that kind of thing happens more. Um, but one thing that is very key is that I think the liquidity of the oil paintings absolutely has come and developed out of the watercolors. Mm -hmm. So that quick spontaneity, the way it's really wet, the, the the crappy brushes that I use, I use them in both both materials, both kinds of paint. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, I have another question here. Um, can you describe the quest to make the ultimate red painting, and if there are any art historical works which influence that objective? Yes, I actually have a whole lecture on the ultimate red painting. <laughs> and I'm working on the ultimate pink painting lecture, which is different. Um, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of uh, paintings that are the ultimate red painting. Um, I would say like uh, Rothko's uh, Seagram's paintings, the paintings that he made that, you know, never went to that building because he heard they were going to be in the restaurant and didn't want sort of people eating around his paintings like, background noise. Um, those paintings are ultimate red paintings in my mind. Um, Matisse's red studio, um, Barnett Newman's, um, you know, what is it? Sir Hieronymus, you know, I can't say the name of the painting. I have to read it. Um, uh, and you know, there are a lot of Joan Brown red paintings that are incredible. Um, I'm trying to think of my lecture. Um, but the, what, what I like about it is it's my idea of the ultimate red painting is really this idea of the sublime red painting. Mm -hmm. And it has changed over my course of thinking about it. And at one point it was a kind of a darker red and then it became a much brighter red. Um, and it's really not important if I make an ultimate red painting, it's kind of a carrot on a stick that moves me through making work. So I've made, I actually do think I finally did make an ultimate red painting, um, which was exciting, but, and that kind of quiet, that kind of, uh, held me for a little while, but then I, I just went back again. Um, 
One thing I've noticed is that it's a lot easier to make an ultimate red painting if you use blue. <laughs> so if you don't use blue, it's harder. Um, so I have a question from Tim. He wants to know where did the idea for the bridge on wheels come from? <laughs> um, I think that a lot of artists have this, so I don't feel like it was an idea I invented. It's just super practical. I had a, a wood one a long time ago, like 15 years ago. And that was really stupid because it's heavy and not efficient. My husband actually made the one that I have now. He's also a painter and, um, you know, he kind of figured out how to make it work. So mm -hmm. he's the genius behind my bridge. <laughs> we have another studio related question here. Um, if a finished painting stays in the studio long enough, do you find yourself continuing to revisit and rework it? Or is a finished painting totally finished? A finished painting is totally finished. Um, they have a really, they, they really conclude. They have a, a, a kind of done, doneness when they are done. Um, but your question is on to something, which is the idea that things that hang around, hang around and stay on my mind. And it's nice to have that happen. You know, it's nice to have a painting that doesn't leave for a while um, because it can overlap with more other, with other ideas and kind of interconnect in my mind. And um, I think it becomes something that I'm still thinking about, just not as directly. And so I really appreciate having, um, that happen. On the other hand, my studio has a finite amount of room. So, you know, it's tricky, but. And we have one more question here. Um, I really love the, from Meow, Meow, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I'm sure I mispronounced that. Um, I really love the first lobster painting, Rebecca, how you find your own style and decide sorry, and decide to stick with it. Sorry, how do you decide to um, find your own style and decide to stick with it? Um, I mean, how do you find your own style? That's a hard one. You, you, you bust your ass. <laughs> find it, find it. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it's funny to think about that because um, I think I think about that differently now. Um, I used to think about, you know, how, how do you make your work? What's your work? What's your life's work? What does it look like? How do you get there? Those kinds of questions. And then somehow it happens and you get to that point and you're not even quite, I mean, you might, I could probably explain how I got there. Uh, but it always, it doesn't really feel like, Oh, voila, I've arrived. I'm there. It's not a, a moment where you have this huge consciousness that you did it, but you see that you did it. And then the next problem is to actually disrupt <laughs> your style and what you do because you can become complacent and you can become your own school of, or your own kind of hack. Uh, and, and I, I want to always be having my work growing and going to a new place. So, um, I think the first part of being an artist is finding your style or finding what your work is about. And then the second part is making sure that you keep active and curious and don't just accept that and keep making the same thing for the next 20 something years. But how do you do it? I think you make a lot of paintings. You make a lot of bad paintings. You follow the energy of what you're interested in. And you have to listen to your own voice in your head. You go to school. That really helps. And then what really helps is to leave school. So all the voices stay in your head, but the people leave. And then you're left with the chance to figure it out and to see what sticks and what happens to your work. That's fantastic and definitely true. <laughs> um, so I think maybe we've, I think we've maybe gone through all the questions. 
We actually uh, just got one sure. more in. If we, oh. if we have time for one more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's yeah. one more from Monica. She's oh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, so great answer at the end of the video you shared. The growth of confidence definitely shows in your work. You also have this powerful magic of magic of growing confidence in your students. Remember you were saying to us, treasure the raw energy from your frustration that shows in the early works. How do you how do you sustain the raw energy in your paintings? Well, I think the scale is something that I really love with that. And I think changing scales as I work. So I um, like when I do a really big painting, I like to do a really small painting afterwards so that I'm dislocating myself. So I don't get too comfortable and knowing what I do. And I think the key word is raw. Like there's got to be something where I can't um, totally understand how to get at something in the same way. Like, you know, if I make big paintings all the time, I, I get, you know, I get it. I figure out the space. And then, um, but working a smaller painting then is like really weird. And uh, I've got to shift again. So um, that really helps. Also taking time to travel and have new experiences, reading, um, all of those things I think help. But uh, it's also a combination of finding routine and then disrupting routine. I feel like I'm kind of saying the same thing, but I, I think it's because I'm the same person and this is what works. But, um, it's a good question. And it's sweet to hear from Monica and Meow. <laughs> They're former students. So it's really very touching. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm so glad that, Everybody was able to jump on. I enjoyed everybody's questions. Um, I want to, again, thank you, Rebecca, for taking the time out of your day to be here. I also want to thank Evan and Borderlami Gallery for helping us put this together. Um, this has been absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you, Evan, because Evan was a real superhero for this event. <laughs> Oh my God! Thank you, Rebecca. This is this is, this is fantastic. Always good to hear your your thoughts. <laughs> nice to meet you all virtually. Thank yes, you. Hopefully, thank you. we'll make it out to LA and see you in person. <laughs> I'd like to leave, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. We'll meet someplace. We'll meet you in New York, Rebecca. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.